Prepare for a rude awakening. Shalom, Torah fans. This is Michael Rood near a lot overlooking the Red Sea, or in Hebrew, the Yam Suf, the body of water that the Israelites crossed on dry land nearly 3,400 years ago. Religious tradition, as well as the Iron Fist of Rome, has ruthlessly sacrificed dissenters for the past 1,600 years. Both powers have kept the majority of the world's population in the dark concerning the location of the real Mount Sinai. The scriptures record that Moses was a shepherd in the land of Midian when he came across the burning bush at Mount Sinai. Shaul, Paul, wrote 2,000 years ago that Mount Sinai was in Arabia, which is the ancient land of Midian. However, Constantine's mother, on a mission to select holy sites for their new Roman universal religious cult, ignored the scriptures and selected a ridiculously little hilltop in the Egyptian peninsula as her personal Mount Sinai. Religious tradition, on the same hand, blinds adherents to the truth that is sitting before their very eyes. We quickly read past the details and ignore the records that disagree with the theology of our most comfortable denomination. The verse that has become the motto for the modern church is found in Matthew 5:17. Think not. That is not all that the verse says, but we like to isolate phrases from the Bible, strip them from their context, ignore the original language, and go about our merry religious way, don't we? No! We want to get back to the faith of the first century followers of the Messiah. I do not follow the traditions or teachings of a man-made sect. I follow the Jewish Messiah and do my best to follow his instructions. And he instructed his followers to obey Moses. Moses' instructions from the Almighty are still alive. They are powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. That word exposes the intentions of our hearts. Whether we are striving to preserve our positions of power in the halls of man-made ecclesiastical traditions or servants who have our hearts tuned to hear his voice and feed his sheep. Now, episode six in the 11 part series, The Sinai Connection, Israel's ancient title deed to the land. Constantine, after a long succession of emperors who were unable to quash and to quell the faith of the early believers, then began to mix in Babylonian, Persian, and Roman sun god worship in. He took on the worship of Easter, which was always part of his life, and he made a proclamation that all Messianic Jews, all believers, had to subscribe to. And that was, he said that you will no longer keep any of the celebrations of the Jews. He made this proclamation and made them swear to it. You will keep none of the Jewish superstitions, none of the feast of the Jews, he called them. Of course, the Bible calls them the feast of the Lord. The Jews were just supposed to keep them. They were the feast of the Lord. But Constantine stripped away everything Jewish and brought in all this pagan sun god worship. And if you did not follow Constantine in his new religion, then you were dead. Nothing changed, except he changed the name of Mithra, who was born on December 25th, changed it a little bit to Jesus, and basically what we ended up with, Babylonian sun god worship in different clothing. This is what we inherited. Now, Constantine sent his mother down to Jerusalem to pick out holy sites for his new world church-state religion that everyone was required to kowtow to. In fact, it was simple for the pagans because instead of praying to Mars, now you can pray to Saint Martin. They changed the names a little bit 
to saints so that they could continue praying to their gods, but it was just changed a little bit. So it made the pagans completely happy. But what he did is took away everything Jewish, including the Jewish Messiah, and replaced it with basically a Roman pagan sun god. Now, his mother was sent down to Jerusalem, but it's not called Jerusalem anymore. For 200 years, it has been Elia Capitolina, a pagan capital in which no Jews are allowed to enter under penalty of death. The Romans have erected a temple to Aphrodite. Aphrodite is the Roman version of Easter, the goddess of fertility who is worshipped on Easter or in Alia Capitolina, Aphrodite Sunday. The pagans would make a pilgrimage through the streets of Alia Capitolina and arrive at the temple of Aphrodite on Aphrodite Sunday and it would be filled with Aphrodite lilies where they would worship the queen of heaven. Constantine's mother came in, she broke down the temple of Aphrodite, and over the very foundations built the church of the Holy Sepulcher, so that on Easter Sunday, the pagans could continue to make their pilgrimage through the streets of Jerusalem, now called the Via Dolorosa. They come to the church of the Holy Sepulcher filled with Aphrodite lilies, and they worship the new queen of heaven, Mary. And to this very day, in the courtyard of the Church of the Holy Sepulcher are the broken off pillars of the Temple of Aphrodite. You can stand on them to this very day. Everyone knows that they are the pillars of the Temple of Aphrodite. Then Constantine's mother went over to Bethlehem, which all the believers have been run out of there the last few years, but There was a Tammuz, a temple to Tammuz over there, and the traditional Tammuz cave. She broke down the temple of Tammuz and built the church of the nativity over the Tammuz cave. Now, people line up to go down there and kiss the floor which faces the sun on the very location where child sacrifice was done on December 25th at the child mass and infants were slaughtered on Easter Sunday, and the blood, the eggs of Easter were dyed in the blood of sacrificed infants. Come to Israel on a tour. We will show you things that you have not even imagined here in the Western world. But this is reality. And this is what Constantine's mother did. And then she went down to the Sinai Peninsula of Egypt and picked out a mountain as the latest tourist trap for the Roman religion. Now, if we dared say any of the things that I just said, if we said that a thousand years ago, I would be dead before I left the building. In the time of Constantine, I wouldn't have made it out of here alive. I would have been hauled off before I got the first sentence out of my mouth because I dared to challenge the church-state religion. But guess what? Right now, I'm standing in America, and we happen to have an unalienable right, an inalienable right, a right that cannot be taken away by king, by pope, by anyone else, and that is the right to express my opinion before man and almighty God. And I should have started out by telling you tonight that not everyone here is obligated or required in any way to agree with me on everything. In fact, I so seldom agree with myself on everything that I hardly expect any more out of you. But I will tell you right now that I do not hold one single opinion of which I believe is wrong. (laughs) But I firmly believe that everyone, everyone is entitled to my opinion. (laughs) And so now, let's go to this location in the land of Midian, where Moses was a Midianite shepherd, the real Mount Sinai, which is in Arabia. Make no mistake about it. And when we go to Mount Sinai, I have to tell you the story of how this was found. Ron Wyatt, when he found the crossing site, found the chariot parts, he knew that the Bible was right, for one thing. That was a given, as far as he was concerned that Mount Sinai would be in Arabia, the ancient land of Midian, and by the satellite photography, 
he determined that Jabal el Laws, also called by the Bedouins Jabal Musa, the mountain of Moses, in Saudi Arabia, appeared to be, by the satellite photographs, the area where the children of Israel would have camped. And so he applied for years for a visa to get into Arabia. It was impossible. They would not let him in. And so while he and his two sons were in Israel, he came up with an idea, and he called a friend of his, James Irwin, the astronaut, and also another American Christian archaeologist, and told them that he and his sons were going to leave immediately, go into Jordan, cross the Jordanian desert in the middle of the night, get down to Saudi Arabia, where they would hire their way down to the real Mount Sinai. He did not even call his wife. He only wanted those two men to know so that if something happened to them, then they would know. Didn't tell anyone else on the planet. And he stole his way across the desert, got down to Jabal al Laws, and found artifacts scattered that testified of over a million people camping there for an entire year. You just don't hide that kind of evidence even after that period of time. He videoed, he photographed, he got nearly out of the country, stopped at the border, he was arrested, thrown in prison, and he was going to be tried and executed as an Israeli spy with his two sons. How did that happen? The Christian archaeologist called the Saudi embassy and said that three Israeli spies matching the wife's descriptions, would be crossing the border because he knew that if he had the Wyatts killed, he would get the credit for the find of Mount Sinai. That is a testimony to the integrity of professional archaeologists. And unfortunately, that is also a testimony of many Christians. When someone says they're a Christian, many times, I just have to clasp both hands firmly over my wallet and back up against the wall. <laughs> because you never know why they're telling me this and giving me this line. Now the reason I'm saying that is because I am a believer. And if there's something that stinks in the body, we have got to be forthright and say it stinks and get it cleaned up. The rest of the world knows the hypocrisy. They see it. We can't look at it, we can't face it, we can't say that what we've inherited is pagan sun god worship and get cleaned up. No, we can do it. We will do it. So, we will call it as it is. Wyatt, for 76 days, was held in prison, telling the same story, his son's telling the same story over and over again. Finally, a Saudi prince flew in on a helicopter from Riyadh with two archaeologists from Riyadh University, went down and interrogated Wyatt, listened to him, put him on a chopper, flew him out to this mountain, and when they saw what Wyatt showed them, when he showed them an altar made of unhewn stones, and on this huge altar out there in the desert made of unhewn stones were petroglyphs carvings, rock carvings of the cow and bull gods, Apis and Hathor, the Egyptian cow and bull gods. When the archaeologists saw this, they said, this is Egyptian. This has never been part of Midianite or Arabian culture. They knew what it was, and they immediately erected a 10-foot chain link fence around the base of it, around the entire altar, Around the entire base of Mount Sinai, they put this 10-foot chain link fence with barbed wire, a guard shack, and an archaeological site by royal decree, no trespassing. They knew this was Mount Sinai. Wyatt was immediately released, but he never was able to get back into Saudi Arabia. He left without a shred of evidence. Many years later, while I was working with Ron, down at the museum, he gave me some video footage of the altar to the golden calf and some photographs. And, he's, and I asked him, where did you get these? And he said, he can't tell me because the people's lives would be in danger. Okay, that's enough, that's fine. 
Last year, I was traveling in the southern state and doing a meeting one evening. And at the end of that meeting, a couple came up to me and said, where did you get that video footage of the altar to the golden calf in Mount Sinai? Where did you get these pictures? And I said, they were given to me by the archaeologist that found the site, but he told me that he can't tell me where he got them because the people's lives would be in danger. The gentleman looked at me and he said, right answer, we're the people. We're the people. I am an oil field engineer. For 13 years, I worked for Saudi Aramco. I have over 200 hours of high-resolution video footage. I have thousands of photographs, and we want you at our house tomorrow morning for Shabbat because everything that we have is yours to use to help get this message out. Well, you know where I was the next morning. <laughs> this was the treat. This was the reason that I was on this grueling schedule, and I didn't even want to stop at this place and teach. I was so exhausted, but all of a sudden as I was praying, I knew I was to show up. I knew something special was going to happen, but I didn't know it was that special. And so tonight, I am going to be able to show you things that we have only hoped that one day we would be able to see. And so I'm going to allow Jim Caldwell, the oil field engineer for Saudi Aramco, who is now safely back in the United States, to tell the story concerning the altar to the golden calf. Across the valley floor from the base of Mount Sinai lie the remarkably preserved remains of the altar to the golden calf. Once again, I was miraculously able to slip inside the fence undetected and record the images of cattle literally covering these rocks. These petroglyphs, or rock carvings, represent distinctly Egyptian gods, with Hathor be, being the female representation and Apis the male. These gods were actively worshipped in Egypt during the time that the Israelites were held captive there. The story is relayed to us in the 32nd chapter of Exodus, where the people grew restless waiting for Moses to return from the top of Mount Sinai. The people told Aaron, Up, make us gods to go before us. Aaron took their gold and fashioned for them a molten calf with a graving tool. What is intriguing about the story is that he fashioned a single idol, yet said, in sight of all of Israel, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. The scripture makes the same point later in the chapter when Aaron is explaining to what, what happened to Moses. He claims the people wanted gods to come before them. So he took their gold out, and out came a calf, once again singular. Looking at this site, however, the scripture becomes beautifully clear. Aaron prepared an altar to the idol, and then set the calf on the very top. The cattle you see here were carved right into the rocks upon which it sat. Standing back from the spectacle, one would have seen a golden calf sitting atop the rock carvings of Apis and Hathor, their former Egyptian gods. The calf, along with the images beneath it, would have been correctly spoken of as plural. These be thy gods, O Israel. It is noteworthy to mention that cattle have never been native to Saudi Arabia. These Egyptian gods, carved in stone, found here near the foot of the mountain, surely give us yet another piece of evidence proving the certain truth of the Word of God. It is here at Mount Sinai where we have the record of the first time that a feast to the Lord is declared. And it is done right here at this altar to the golden calf. And it says in Exodus, when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down, that they said to Aaron, get up and make us gods which shall go before us. As for this Moses, we have no idea what's become of him. Now the word delayed in this English language is much like the word returned. When we say that someone returned, that means that they were there before and they've come back. When the word delayed is used, it indicates that there is a time in which they are expected to come, but that expectation is delayed. Moses delayed to come down. 
And when he delayed to come down, the evil that was in their heart was manifested. If he would have come down when they expected him, probably everything would have been okay. But Moses delayed, and so they finally said, as for this Moses character, we have no idea what's become of him, so Aaron, make us gods that will go before us. And Aaron built an altar before the golden calf, and Aaron made proclamation, tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Literally, in the Hebrew, it says, tomorrow is a feast to Yahweh. Every time you see capital L, capital O, capital R, and capital D in the English versions of the Bible, in the Hebrew, it is always yod heh vav heh Yahweh, the name of the Lord. The Lord is not a name, it's simply a title given to every British landowner for the past thousand years. When we read in the English version of the Bible, praise the name of the Lord, you might rightly say, I would like to. What is it? Because in Hebrew it says, praise the name of Yahweh. In the English when it says, all those that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, you might say, well, I'd like to be saved. What's his name? Because in Hebrew it says, in the book, in the Hebrew language, it says, all those that call upon the name of Yahweh shall be saved. That's why in the Brit Hadashah, in the New Testament, it says that the Son has come in the Father's name. The Son's name is Yahshua. Yah, which is the poetic short form of Yahweh, and Shua, which is the contracted form of Yeshua, which means salvation. Yahweh Yeshua. Yahweh is our salvation. That is the name of our Lord, of our Savior. And I, I use his, uh, you know, I guess you could call his Gentile nickname Jesus. I use that once in a while so people in the Western world know who I'm talking about. But, you know, we did part of our television show in which we do a man on the street interview. And we did one of these man on the street interview episodes in downtown Jerusalem. And we asked a very interesting question. And we said, uh, the, the question was, do you speak Hebrew? First of all, we found out that they spoke English. And we said then, do you speak Hebrew? And they answered, yes, we, we speak Hebrew. And so I then asked the question, what does the name Jesus mean in Hebrew? And they would get a very confused expression and say, well, Jesus doesn't mean anything because Jesus is not a Hebrew word. Exactly our point. Yahshua, they know. Yahshua means Yahweh is our Yeshua. Our salvation. And so when Aaron spoke these words, he made a golden calf and literally said, tomorrow is a feast to Yahweh. And the Lord blessed Israel because he was so moved by their passionate display of devotion to him in that they dedicated a pagan festival to him just as they had learned from the Egyptian sun god worshipers. Those of you who cannot see the reference to that, that is found in Second Opinions chapter 5, verse 17. Now those of you who may not be that familiar with the Hebrew Scriptures, there is no book of Second Opinions. In fact, it says, And Yahweh spoke unto Moshe, saying, Leave me alone, that my wrath may wax hot, and that I may consume them. He wanted to toast us all. Why? He just got through saying, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Literal in the Hebrew, no other gods in my face. I don't want to see them. I don't want to smell them. I don't want to be reminded of these pagan gods that the Canaanites have brought into the land or that you have been worshiping in Egypt. I want no other gods in my face. He said, I don't want the name of other gods to even come out of your mouths. He said, do not learn the way of the heathen. Do not learn how they worship and serve their gods and do the same thing and say you're doing it to me. It's an abomination, which in Hebrew means utterly repulsive, repugnant, putrid, and vile. That is what the Almighty says. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never changes. And the very issues that got the Canaanites thrown out of the land, 
The very issues that got Israel thrown out of the land are the very issues that we are now dealing with in our religious culture in America and around the world. Moses interceded for us and we were not consumed. But the Almighty had an intermediate remedy for this. Moses ground up the golden calf, he ground it into powder, and then he put it in the drinking water. And then we were all to drink the water with the powder of the gold from the golden calf. Now, any medical professional will tell you that drinking that concentration of gold would produce profuse, unstoppable diarrhea. We could get the gold back. <laughs> but you know, sometimes it's just not worth mining through your old religious systems to find a few nuggets of truth. Join us again next time for Episode 7 of the 11 Par series, The Sinai Connection, Israel's ancient title deed to the land. This is Michael Root at the Yom Suf bidding you shalom, peace, and I will see you when the smoke clears.